Hi, this is Robin Ashler with Women of Passion and Legacy, where we spotlight women who've recognized their personal and unique drive to have purpose, to take one step at a time, and to make a difference, whether locally, nationally, or internationally. These women, just like you and me, have had their own fears and life challenges, but they've pushed through them to accomplish one day at a time to progress toward their dream. They have become the women of passion and legacy. Today, I'm really pleased to introduce Alisa Zander, a highly experienced holistic health coach. She's also been a yoga teacher, a running coach, and a speaker with over 25 years of experience. Excuse me. She began her career as a personal trainer and did not really begin coaching as far as running is concerned, until after she started completing triathlons at the age of 40. She now has completed over 30 marathons. That's pretty amazing, including the Boston Marathon, the New York City, and Chicago Marathons. She's also expanded her work to include Ayurveda with everything else, as if that wasn't enough. <laughs> Not ever to be held back. Alisa is an inspiration for those of us who may be simply, maybe waiting for the best time, which, as we all know, rarely walks up and taps us on the shoulder. So let's welcome Alisa Zander to the Women of Passion and Legacy. Welcome, Alisa. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you today, Robin. Of course, yes. I wouldn't have it any other way. So... In reference to my comment about the right time, you know, that's really hard for all of us to identify because sometimes we think it's the right time and then we get distracted and different life happens. So what kind of shape are your clients, and I hate to put it in those terms, but what are they in when they typically start working with you? Are they already pretty fit and they just want to get to the next level and be coached? Or are they really starting from ground zero where they, they just need to get better health and, and organized with regards to their physical well-being? Well, I'm so glad you started there because when you said that in your introduction, it really stood out to me as far as, you know, the right time, because we always think there's the right time to get started. And truthfully, the right time is probably yesterday or, you know, that expression about the right time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And if not 20 years ago, the next best time is today. So a lot of times we wait for the right time. We think, you know, when I get that promotion, when the kids are in school, when they're out of school, when this thing happens, that will be the right time and I can get started. Unfortunately, life keeps on happening and then that right time or what we think is the right time keeps getting pushed away until, you know, sometimes we get a scary diagnosis or that goal that we had initially that was maybe small, you know, maybe five or 10 pounds or a certain size or, you know, whatever it is that, that you might want, it becomes bigger. It becomes 50 or 60 pounds. It becomes trying to, you know, reverse that diagnosis. So the right time is really right now. There is like, if we're waiting for it, it's not going to happen. It's like, when you think about the right time to have a baby, you know, if you don't, you know, make a, a move to have it, you might never have that baby, whatever your baby is. But to answer the question about my clients, they're at no one particular place. And that's why I always say the best place to get started is where you are and to not judge your journey or where you are on your path to somebody else because we're all at different places. And to think that you have to be so fit to start working with a coach that, you know, maybe there are some coaches out there, you know, depending upon what it is, and maybe it would be, you know, the running side of things. But when it comes to getting healthy, really, the best answer is start now, rather than waiting until it becomes too late, no matter what your goal is. And I see um, my clients are on a full continuum, because we all think we get to a certain point and, oh, now I'm healthy enough. So really, I'm continuously working on my health. And I think that's something that we can all work on is, you know, getting that next level or that just, you know, keep on taking care of ourselves because it's not one of those things where 
Like you can go on a diet for, for 30 days and now you're set for life because you did that diet for 30 days. Yeah. You know, I can, I can really be, re- I think all of us can really relate to that. I know that before COVID for a couple of years, I swam over a mile every single solitary day. And then COVID came and as everybody knows, it completely disrupted our lifestyles. And so when, when post COVID actually the pool that I'd been using had shut down and didn't reopen, they'd gone out of business. Um, so I ended up then trying to take up bicycling and I love it. I love bicycling. And I was going like 20 miles or so um, uh, a week, not a day, (laughs) a week, maybe between 20 and 25 miles a week. But still I was able to get up fairly steep hills and I was challenged by that. But then again, life happened and I don't even remember exactly what it was, but I quit. And my bicycle sat in the garage for almost a year and now I'm trying to get going again but somehow it's just what is it I think it has something to do with mindset getting getting started again but also I think accountability so looking at mindset and accountability and having a coach that you're accountable for how do you how do you balance those Well, that's a great question because I think they're all so intertwined because you have to start with that mindset, seeing yourself as that person who does this thing, because when it becomes non-negotiable, it's a non-negotiable part of your day or your week, you just know it's going to happen. And when you get out of that non-negotiable mindset, you know, if you, and I mean, we've all been there. So it's where we think, oh, you know, I'll let this other thing happen. And it starts to fill that time and space. And then we get used to that new habit that other thing taking up that space. So we think, okay, I'll do it maybe next week or the following week, we get out of the habit. But when we have a coach for accountability or an accountability partner, it really helps us because that person's going to check in. Did you, did you get it done? And if not, why? And the thing is, you know, sometimes things happen, but a lot of times we're really good at finding very realistic and you know they sound like great excuses of why I couldn't do that thing and that might have been true in the moment but if it was really important you would have like carved out space somewhere else in your time but sometimes you know it's like ah you know I'll get to it but that coach can really help you stay on track whether it's a workout or eating right making you know time for your own self care because we let all those other things come in. And it's really interesting because I had just written, yeah, written, written a post about procrastination because a lot of things that happen in our lives that take us off track sound real like really good excuses. And it could be in business where you're avoiding doing the, the work tasks. So you clean your desk, you work on your files, you sort through emails, but you didn't get any of your actual work done. And it's the same thing with our health. We might think, um, oh, I have to clean the dishes. I have to wash the dishes before I go do my workout. Or I have that mountain of laundry to fold. And we fold that laundry, we do the dishes, and then we're exhausted. Okay, so now I can't do the workout, but I'll do it tomorrow. because. But I got all this good stuff done. And not to say you don't need to take care of the other things, but really bottom line, you're your most important investments are really taking care of your health before all those other things make all those other things so much easier. You know, that's a really good point. Two two things came to my mind. One is what you just said, making yourself a priority. And a lot of us struggle just with that small, not so small thing, piece of mindset that that it's the kids, it's the partner, it's work, it's our parents, it's it's always, and I think it's especially challenging for women, at least I hear that over and over and over again, that we are constantly putting ourselves at the bottom of that list. And so it's a, I think mindset is crucial in, in accomplishing what you really want to accomplish. Let's let's jump here for a minute. I want to talk about how you got started because I think there's a tie-in here. Um, how did you get started running? 
what what all of a sudden hit you that you said, oh, I'm going to run a marathon? <laughs> so that for me, that's a great question. And running is now such a huge part of my life. But years ago, and I've always been into fitness. I've always loved working out and doing things like that. I, I taught my friends or always classes when I was a teenager and my, I'd have little classes in my bedroom when my neighbors would come over. But I thought running was boring. If I had to get on a treadmill, I, I might walk a little bit. And then I thought, oh, that's just, you know, I can't do that. It's, it's just, you know, no good, no fun. And alongside it, I would watch the Ironman triathlons on TV, which were so inspiring because they have all these stories of people with major challenges in their life overcoming this huge distance. And I decided I wanted to do a sprint triathlon, which is smaller than a, an Ironman. It's much smaller, but it's faster. So you're working your butt off in a, as fast as you can. And to do a, a sprint triathlon, it is a roughly half mile swim, then a 12 to 15 mile bike ride, and then a 5K running, which is 3.1 miles. And so I had to start practicing in all of those sports in order to do the triathlon. And people would ask me which was my favorite sport. And I really wasn't sure. But running, in a sense, was easy because you didn't need any extra equipment. You didn't have to go anywhere special. You could just put on your running shoes and go. And I started doing, I, I actually jumped into half marathons pretty quickly. And a friend of mine noticed my half marathon times. And there are different calculators out there that will kind of guess what your marathon time would be based on your half marathon time. And they said to me, you could probably qualify for the Boston Marathon based on these calculators. And I thought wow. that was amazing because at that point, I hadn't even considered running a marathon. But that just little lit a little fire under me. And I decided to sign up for a marathon. So I started running at the age of 40 when I was doing the, the triathlons and the triathlons and the running overlapped for quite a while. But then I, I just quickly fell so deeply in love with running that I primarily switched to marathons. But when I did that first marathon, I worked my butt off. I can't tell you I qualified at the first one, but I qualified at my second one. And to me, that was just the greatest thing. Even before I got to go to the Boston Marathon, it just was very surreal to know that I qualified for something that I never even dreamed at that point to do. So that, you know, was a roundabout way of triathlons taking me into marathons. But, you know, now, like I said, marathoning and not just even marathoning, because it's been a little while since I've run a marathon. But I run with my husband and our dog, Sadie, just about, you know, probably four to six days a week. And we love it. And it's really a huge part of who I am. I think you hit on something important there. And it has to do with having a coach, too. You had a friend that came up to you and said, wow, you know, you could you could do the Boston Marathon, given the time that you're running. And I think that when we have somebody outside of especially outside of our family that we admire that or that is is somebody that we respect in the very least comes up to us and says you know what you could do that if you really wanted to that we it it flips a switch in our head that allows us to truly believe that we're capable of this and i think that's such a huge part of life in general is just believing that you can do something helps you get motivated to actually do it. So having a coach really, I think, plays that role. Wouldn't you say so too? I would absolutely say so. And in fact, one of my coaches along the way, he would say, if you don't believe in yourself, then trust in my belief in you because I believe you can do it. So you can borrow my belief if you don't have it right now. And that was just such an eye opener, too, because if some like you said, if somebody outside of me can see that it's possible and they're not just, you know, filling me up with fluff, they're sincere and they really think that this is possible for me and I respect them, then I have to think there's something to that. And honestly, that's really, truly how I did it, because 
like I said, I didn't even think it was possible to run a marathon for me. Like I thought that was for other people. But once, you know, I could see it through this person's eyes, I realized, you know, yeah, this is something that I could do. And it became a goal. It became something where I started to live as if, and I would picture myself at the Boston Marathon. I would picture myself finishing my goal race and, you know, crossing the line and knowing that I qualified. So I had to start borrowing their beliefs and being able to see it and visualize it for myself. Yeah, that so that's is, really that's a lot really of what, I'm sorry, I was just say that's what a lot of what I do with my clients as well, because sometimes I can see things that they can't see because they've been so used to their reality of, of whatever it is and feel like I have to settle for this or I'm stuck here. And knowing that nobody is truly stuck, not if, if they want to make a change. Yeah, I think I think that as if phrase is so important. Um, I'm a lot older. So I remember back to one of the first books um, that I remember being written about the power of visualizing as far as athletes are concerned. And um, it was a, it was actually a book about tennis, the inner game of tennis. And, and then the inner game of a lot of other things came out. But it is, it's, it's so crucial for you to use that visualization to see yourself doing, to act as if you're doing it, to, to be a winner. And I think that that whole mindset is not, is not just, well, obviously, it's not just for athletes. It's for all of us. And, and regardless, it's, it's a matter of identifying what it is that we want to accomplish and actually visualizing and believing and acting as if we've already accomplished it. Then there's no question. You just have to go out and do it. So um, I think that's particularly appropriate for this show because our goal for this whole show is to inspire people to do maybe what they didn't think they could do or to even take those few extra moments to figure out what it is that's important to us and and then to to act as if to change our mindset so that we can accomplish it in in for others to see we've already accomplished it for ourselves now we have to go out and let others see that we've accomplished it would you agree with that i absolutely would and and when you were speaking it made me think of women or I mean, men can embody this as well. But sometimes and so I'll say people, a person may lose a tremendous amount of weight, but they have not really embraced that that's who they are. And when they look in the mirror, they sometimes whether they look in the mirror or think of themselves, still picture themselves as that less healthy person. So until they make that shift until we make that shift and start to see ourselves as that healthier person, it can be really hard to make the, the follow-up decisions to stay in that body. So that's why um, we all might know somebody, or maybe we've been there ourselves where we've lost a whole bunch of weight, got, you know, and we can use Oprah as an example. I mean, Oprah's lost a lot of weight. She's had times where she's lost a lot of weight, but it takes being able to sit in that mindset of, I am now this healthy person to be able to continue to make those healthier choices. Cause it can be really tempting when you go after you have lost all that weight, you possibly deprived yourself depending upon how you did it. And then if you think, okay, I, I've reached the finish line. I I'm at this, you know, but it's there, like I said before, there's no finish line. You don't just lose the weight and then, you know, it magically stays there. You have to now start to see yourself as that healthier person, as that person who, maybe says, I'll just have two bites of that yummy, delicious, whatever it is. And, and then I think the other part of it too, is compassion, because we all slip up, we all make mistakes, things happen, we have an off day. And it's what happens after that off day, do you continue to spiral? Or do you say, you know what, messed up yesterday, I had the I ate the whole cake, or whatever it was, I ate the whole bag of chips. And I'm going to forgive myself. And today's a new day and I'm going to, you know, go back to embracing that healthier version of me. So 
I think there's two things that come in. Well, there's probably more things, but it's the mindset for sure. Seeing yourself as that healthier person or whatever it is, the goal, and then compassion and forgiveness when, when you mess up. So whether your goal is a business goal, a health goal, a fitness goal, you know, it's having that compassion and realizing that we all make mistakes and we all, you know, maybe step a little sideways, but we, if we want to go forward, we have to forgive ourselves. I think that is such a crucial point as well. Wow, you're hitting gold today. Self-forgiveness is often the hardest thing that we grapple with. Um, And it does. It definitely kind of snowballs into that self-image. I know, well, I'm in the process of, of moving. And so I'm going through a lot of old stuff and downsizing and letting it go. And I ran across some photographs from way back in 19, well, I guess I don't need to tell you, (laughs) although I don't really make much of a big deal about, well, I do, I'm proud of being the age that I am, but um, I saw some pictures of myself and I'm thinking, I think if I'm remembering correctly, I was about 32 when I had the pictures taken, I'd actually gone to a professional photographer and had a bunch of photographs taken. And um, I looked at those and I went, wow, I didn't look all that bad. <laughs> and, and yet my self-image, and I remember it vividly, was quite the opposite. And even though I'm the same person who back when I was 32 was looking at those pictures, I saw them critically. And now I look at them and I think, wow, if I'd known then what I know now, I would have been proud of looking like that. So it's, and then and then from there, you're right, the next step is so that we don't, you know, continue to visualize, visualize ourselves in such a way that we end up being that way. You know, I, I've done, I think everybody who's ever lost weight has has gained it and lost it and gained it and lost it. There's very, even movie stars, you know, that they have the same issues. Um, That it's a matter of getting to that point of forgiving ourselves and finding that, that mindset within us that says, no, I really am a fit and healthy person. And I am not that person that I thought I was anymore ever again. And, and that's, that's the hard point. And I think that too is another good incentive to get yourself a coach because sometimes we all, we all get into those stages where we need that outside person to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you doing? And why are you doing that to yourself? For sure. And I think the other element of it is making the choices for a lifestyle for a lifetime, because we all hear about the fad diets or eat this, eat grapefruits and you'll lose 20 pounds and nobody wants to eat grapefruits for, you know, a month straight or whatever it is. So it's finding the swaps, finding the small changes that you can make that are sustainable for a lifetime so that it's not a way of feeling deprived. Like for instance, I used to have somebody in my family who did not really understand the healthy way that I eat. I eat fairly healthy. I mean, I'm not perfect, but I eat pretty healthy. And those are things that I've decided were very important to me because I know they make me feel better. But this person used to tease me and say, you know, Elisa, don't you want this Twinkie? And like, to me, the Twinkie would have been punishment. Like it didn't sound like something good to me because it's got, I've gotten to a point in my life where I know that, you know, fruits and vegetables light me up and make me feel better in my body. Um, So, but I came to that from small changes. I, you know, started things like reading labels and I gradually made one little change after another, but those And some of the changes, so that's, I guess, another secret too that I want to share. When you make a change or when you try something out, it's like experimenting. It's, you know, what, how would I feel if I did this for a week? What change would that make? And then see what it does. Because sometimes we think if we change something that, oh, I'm going to have to do this forever. But it's finding the changes, finding the habits, the choices that set you up to feel good. 
and making those in small changes and small little intervals because it's not about having the fad diet. It's not about doing something to, you know, get in that dress for the, the class reunion. And then, you know, as soon as the reunion's done, you go and you pig out immediately afterwards. So, and I mean, some people do that and, you know, more power to them, but then, you know, then the next thing comes along and then the next thing. So it's, it's for anybody who really wants to feel better in their body. Those are the type of people that I work with people who want to, you know, make a change for feeling better in their bodies and not just um, a quick fix. Yeah, I I remember um, to that to that end. Um, I, again, this was a number of years ago. I did a um, a garlic fast because I wanted to flush out my body, and I did. It was like a four or five day garlic fast, and um, it was wonderful. I was going down to the Getty Museum. I had a, a at that point a, a a friend, a male friend who'd invited me to go see the big Getty Museum in Los Angeles. And um, I remember how magnificent that whole trip was. And I, and I attribute it a hundred percent to the garlic flush because it had cleared out my body to the degree where my, all of five of my senses were so heightened that everything looked brighter, everything looked clearer. This, this, the um, sounds, the the tastes, the visual. I mean, all the smells. Everything was so clean and clear from this fast. Um, it was kind of funny because the minute I sat down in his car on the way to the museum, I said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. I've been doing a garlic fast all week." And he says, "Yeah, I know. I can tell." <laughs> I was afraid I you were going to say that. About that side effect, but but the sad part was okay. I did too much too fast because when I went off of that fast, in fact, it was him that got me off the fast at the end of the museum uh, day. I was starving, and and normally I would have just you know kept up with my the right things to eat, but here he was eating in front of me. And he, and he absolutely insisted that I have something to eat. And it just all went downhill from there. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, if you've got a secret that you could share, that when we make those kinds of mistakes in our lives, when we jump in, and I have a habit of doing this all the time, I jump in feet first into the deep end without thought of how I'm going to extract myself. <laughs> And then I don't end up, you know, doing what's right uh, for myself to ease out of that and back into a normal lifestyle. So normal, um, usual lifestyle. So I, do you understand what I'm, I'm saying? And, and how do you address that? Well, I do. And I actually, in my program, I have a seasonal cleanse because in Ayurveda, we tend to like to cleanse. Um, at the change of season. So usually um, summer to fall, because we're going from the heat to, to the cooler, and then from winter to spring. And the way that I do my cleanse, and it's a self, it's a guided cleanse, but it's a self-directed in a sense cleanse. Um, we ease in, and then we have a, a time where it's a little deeper into the cleanse, and then we ease out. So it's all already set in there. So that way it's not abrupt one way or the other. Because sometimes if we slam on the brakes and, you know, stop now, luckily you enjoyed your cleanse or your fast, but some people that just feels like deprivation and, you know, they're not going to do it. And then coming out of it too fast where, you know, you, um, like you said, you went, you know, right into, oh, I'm starving. So I'm going to eat. Um, and of course you, the, the cleanse that I do, you're actually allowed to eat a little bit more. It's, it's more about. Um, decluttering your body, decluttering your mind, decluttering your space. So um, it's not just down to one thing, although there is um, one choice and it's it's a choice that some people make. I, t I, I generally don't even make that choice. That's a little more restrictive and it's based on, I don't know, you mentioned Ayurveda. So it sounds like you might know a little bit about Ayurveda, but there are, there are different doshas. 
So that choice is not good for my primary body type or dosha. So I tend to stay away from that one. But it's all about that kindness of easing in and then easing out so that it's not abrupt in either direction. So that way you can um, slowly ease into it and then ease out so that you feel good, so that it that you feel successful on both ends of it. Yeah, it, it's crucial. And in fact, yes, I'm I'm a little bit familiar with Ayurveda. Um, I actually met um, Dr. Raju, who's Vaidya Krishna Raju, about seven or eight years ago. He was visiting from India and offering, uh, you know, you, you brought up the, the subject of change of seasons. Well, you can look at that in another way, which is hormonally. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that, too that he was visiting from India specifically to offer an Ayurvedic banana treatment for women on their, on their menses. So um, to, to quote, I wrote down this, this quote from his website so that people might understand really more. It says, the banana treatment improves assimilation and absorption of nutrients and proper hormone secretions for everyone, because it works mainly through the vibration and it affects everything. So during menstruation, the banana treatment is highly purifying and it helps a lot for almost everything. I mean, the word everything keeps coming up in this quote. Um, and when you're not going through your monthly, it's also helpful and good to do. And it's long-term good for reproduction and healthy progeny. I mean, the list goes on in this, this quote of all the wonderful things that just this one treatment that's Ayurvedic does. And there's countless Ayurvedic treatments. So, um, yeah, how did you get into Ayurveda? And and how do you, I mean, you, you've given a, a small example of how you use it, but how do you now work with it? Okay, so Ayurveda is basically the sister science of yoga. So when I was first going through my yoga teacher training, I was introduced to Ayurveda. And there are all these words that, it sounds like a foreign language, but it kind of is, it's Sanskrit, which is kind of pretty much considered a dead language, but it is used around yoga, it's used around Ayurveda. And when I first was introduced to it, it sound, sounded a little scary. And some of the changes that some of my teachers would talk about making, it seems a lot. But then I learned it was just like any change where maybe you pick one thing and you work on that. And the way that I describe Ayurveda to, to most people is one, it's about balance. So it's about learning to create balance with your body and nature. And living in rhythm with with nature so you know not staying up all night and sleeping till you know noon the next day it's it's understanding that there are certain times of the day that are better for us to wake up and eat and move our bodies and then also understanding and i mentioned the doshas are the energy so the three doshas are vata pitta and kapha and those energies or doshas make up each of us and they make up our bodies so every single cell of our body has all three doshas and we have all three doshas. Although you may hear some people say, oh, I'm a vata or I'm a kapha or I'm a pitta. But we each have one that is usually the predominant one. Um, and then there's one that's usually a little closer and then one that we have lesser of. There are very few people who are across the board of all three. But once you understand a little bit more about your unique body type among those doshas, you can start to figure out the things that help create balance for you and the things that take you out of balance. And the way that I really work the most with my clients is looking at where they're out of balance. And that might be symptoms that they describe, you know, maybe they're not sleeping well, or for instance, somebody who says a head, they have a headache or they have lots of headaches. Well, describe those headaches, because in the words that you use to describe those headaches, you're giving me clues as to where your imbalance is. And so we look at what's where the imbalance is and trying to create balance. So that way, instead of just putting a Band-Aid over a symptom, 
we're trying to take a couple steps back and prevent those headaches from happening. And so that to me is the beauty of Ayurveda because it's about creating that balance. It's about prevention. And just like you mentioned the banana, a lot of people, or I've heard it called this, um, called kitchen medicine because we use foods, we use um, spices and herbs, things that we think about, um, you know, just every day in cooking up a meal, but they have medicinal qualities. Like we've all heard about turmeric and different things like that. And so rather than depending on a pill or a, a supplement or, you know, a, you know, a prescription, we can look to our kitchen sometimes to help ourselves feel better naturally without depending on any of those outside things. It's, it's amazing what natural treatments can do. I mean, um, oh, there's so much in, packed into what you just said, too, I, I, that I want to bring up. But one of them is um, I, I had a, um, a I, it wasn't even a rash because you couldn't feel it, but it was itchy on the on my neck here where I'm rubbing. And I could have gone to a dermatologist and gotten a pill or I decided to use coconut oil. So I now, even now, um, I for uh, it took a couple of weeks of every night putting coconut oil on that spot where it was itchy, and it's gone away. Uh, it was a form of psoriasis, but it was treated with the coconut oil, and it was a very simple thing to do. And now, when I'm under stress and the psoriasis starts coming back, I just rub the oil on it, and it and it. In a day or two, it's gone. It's and so it's wonderful. And headaches, you know, it's the same. Oh, headaches, that's the other thing. I just learned the other day, and I don't know if it's Feng Shui or Ayurveda. I mean, there's so many of these Eastern uh, modalities that are so fascinating to me. But I read, don't sleep with your head to the north. And I thought, well, what the heck is that all about? In fact, you know, uh, it was. Um, Oh, he, he, he is a comedian. I, I, uh, his name will come to me in a minute. But um, I looked it up and it said that the reason that this is uh, a belief, and it hasn't been scientifically, there's no quote unquote data supporting it, but that it has to do with magnetic north. And magnetic north, when your head's to the north, it kind of messes with a lot of things in your body are you familiar with that i am actually i am and i have yeah. moved my bed because of that so just so you know yeah you know it's funny because i i always had my my bed arranged so that my head was actually facing west i was sleeping with my head to the west not facing west but with my head on the west <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I rearranged my room. And for the last year or so, I've been sleeping with my head to the north. And you know, the truth is, I, I have had more headaches. I was thinking about that. And I thought, this is nuts. <laughs> but now I'm moving. It's not worth me going through all of the physical uh, to rearrange my bedroom. I'm just going to live with it for another month until I move, but I'll never sleep with my head to the north again. I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's so funny because I'm I'm trying to remember exactly what I read as well, but I had heard it actually from a few very dependable sources. So I did my research and I looked at, I had my husband get out the, the, uh, the compass and we were like looking exactly which way, because we thought we knew based on roads and things like that, which way we were, were sleeping. And we discovered that there was just a gentle turn to, to the road. And we, we ended up just, like I said, experimenting, moving the bed. And we did see a difference, or I saw a difference. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I weren't moving, I would have done it this weekend. I would have completely rearranged my bedroom again. Because I really genuinely noticed the difference when I think about it. Um, so I want to get back to something you said earlier in our conversation, which had to do with, you know, working and, and being motivated to, to make these kinds of changes. And it occurred to me that this is a perfect venue right now to talk about using some chair yoga. There's a lot of us. Oh, and, and the fact that a lot of us do, I, I'm beginning to come 
to the um, awareness, the increased awareness of how addicted I am to the computer screen. You know, I, I work, I've been working online for decades to the point where now it's hard for me not to be online. And so I think taking, the, I mean, all of this that we've been talking about, I'm going to try to kind of pull it together here as we're coming to a close. But as, as we are, so many of us, whether you realize it or not, addicted to that screen, whether it's TV, whether it's social media, whether it's work online, um, Googling, whatever it is, we are online, I think, for the majority of our days in one way or another, unless you consciously make that effort to get up and run, to get up and bicycle, to get up and swim, to get up and do, just take a walk, a mindful walk out in nature. But pulling that in a little bit to the reality of it, many of us do work all day behind a desk, staring at a computer screen. I think it's important to share a little bit about chair yoga. And even if you'd like to, um, maybe do a little demonstration with us right now. What do you think about that? Well, I don't, I'm not on a chair, but I can give you some examples. And I do um, teach chair yoga. I have some chair yoga videos on my YouTube channel. But the thing I love about chair yoga, because I think, again, we talked about mindset earlier. I think some people will think, oh, well, that's just for old people or that's just for people who can't move. But to me, chair yoga can be just like a lot of the other things we talked about, a continuum, because I've taught chair yoga where it's been pretty like a really great workout the gym that I used to teach at um I would teach a general yoga class like an all levels yoga class and every once in a while we bring the chairs in and we would be doing like a um half moon balancing pose or we'd be doing warrior pose with the chair and I've also taught um a like a more senior class and I've taught classes at retirement homes nursing homes where they were really restricted in movement so the lovely thing about chair yoga is it can be anything you want it to be. It, it's perfect for if you're in an office or if you're traveling. So if you're in, maybe you're waiting in the lounge at the airport or you're in a hotel and you don't have a whole lot of room, but we can sit here and, and you can't really see what I'm doing. I'm doing a, a figure four. So we would bend the leg. Maybe you can kind of tell I have my leg going into a figure four. And then flexing the foot, that's great for a stretch for the, the hip, the glute, the IT band. And we can do that in the chair. We could do that. That's like in a regular yoga class, we might think of doing pigeon pose. We can do um, one of my favorite things, a nice deep breath. So inhaling and reaching the arms overhead. You mentioned pausing and going out in nature, but sometimes just pausing and breathing placing the hands on the chest, closing our eyes. So we, we can make the moves. Oh, let's do that. Okay, let's close it. Close our eyes and breathe for a moment. Inhaling, pausing, and then exhaling through the nose. Or we can exhale through the mouth, a nice sigh. And in general, yeah. I might do that. Yeah, and, and you can do like three breaths and just notice how much three breaths can change your, how you feel about the day. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we can do, I, I don't have a lot of room in here. We can inhale up and then we can exhale and we can twist. And if our, depending upon how our arms are, our shoulders, we might bring our hands to the shoulders and then come back. Uh, I used to do yoga. Oh, every day, every pose you can think of. And loved it. Oh, it was so energizing and freeing. Um, and then life again got in the way. And um, I, and then I had a hip replaced. And I'd been afraid to try some of the the yoga poses, the warrior and the others, because they are stressful. I mean, on your hips. And um, so, although. I know I'm senior. I don't consider myself senior. I can do anything. <laughs> um, 
I am cautious about that kind of stuff. So I, I would love to learn some things from you at some point as to how I can gently, my flexibility is just gone. I can't, I can't even cross my legs anymore. I, I, I cannot sit Indian stuff. Oh, that's not politically correct nowadays, is it? I cannot sit with my legs crossed. Eastern Indian style. Well, and you know what? So I'm glad that you said that because the way that I teach yoga classes is always about what you can do. And there's always a modification because some people like a, a lot of runners I know who might be in fantastic shape cannot sit cross-legged because it's just, you know, we get too tight in our hips. So it's figuring out what you can do and then doing those things. Because honestly, I say that a yoga practice doesn't need to be 60 minutes or 30 minutes. It can be one pose. It could be Shavasana. It could be that time of sitting there at your desk and pausing and just, you know, paying attention to your breath. So we tend to think of yoga as the physicality, which is, you know, for a lot of us, especially in the United States, that's what yoga is. But yoga has, um, when we talk about yoga or the way that I learned about yoga, there are eight limbs to yoga. And that includes meditation and the breath. So um, to me, really, the most important part of, of a yoga practice is the breath. So if you choose to sit at your desk and just pause and breathe, that's a beautiful yoga practice because it doesn't have to be any of those other things. It can be if you want to you know, create space in your hips or work on balance, because like you said, with getting older, as we're getting older, we start to lose balance a little bit. So if we can work on that, we can prevent it. Balance or yoga can help with strength, which is another thing that we lose. As we get older, we start to lose our strength and we need that to, you know, maintain metabolism. So we can be strong and have our balance so that we can, you know, do the activities of daily life. So there are a lot of benefits to the physical side of yoga, but first, you know, if we can embrace wherever we are and then, you know, we can always add on to it if that's the case, or we can, you know, be where we are and again, have that compassion, letting go of judgments and competition and letting go of expectations. I think that's important for everybody to hear is just sitting and breathing. But I would add, that something that I've noticed that makes a big difference in, in many different ways is consciously expanding your chest, you know, consciously pulling your spine up straight, pulling your shoulders back and expanding. And then you mentioned expanding your hips. Now, I'm personally not quite sure how to do that. I That's another curiosity that I'd like to learn. But for me, there's a host of benefit to just learning to sit straight with your shoulders back and breathing and, and doing, um, you know, cross, cross poses, I think is important too. It's good yeah. for the brain. It's really good for the brain. Mm -hmm. And if you can cross your, when you're standing, if you cross one leg one way and your arms the other way, I understand that's got a lot of benefit to it too. So there's a lot of little things, right, that we can do. We just need to be aware of, of what it is. Right. And, and, how to do right. It. and what you said, like it made me think of like being at our computers, a lot of times we hunch forward. Right. And so we're rounding the shoulders. And if we can open that up. So a lot of times in a yoga class, we'll work on opening the chest, expanding. So doing a little bit of a back bend here and, you know, bringing our shoulders back and down because we spend mm -hmm. so much time in that forward hunch, right. whether it's over steering wheels or our computers, our cell phones, we're getting that tech neck where we're like looking down at our phones. So we, we like to reverse a lot of that in a yoga class, but even if you take an hour yoga class a day, that's one hour out of your day. So if you're sitting at your computer and you notice your shoulders getting tight or they're coming forward, you know, consciously, and you said it, consciously opening it and reversing that, and sometimes, I mean, I'll catch myself, my shoulders will be up here and I'm like, relax, breathe, let them go. So important. It's so important. Oh my gosh, I have a feeling we could be on here for hours and continue to learn from you. So thank you so much, Elisa. It's been an absolute joy having you on. 
I want to let everybody know, and before we leave, I am going to show your website uh, and share that. In fact, this is quite a good time to do that. Um, this is uh, Elisa's website. We'll have that down in the description. Uh, and there's a wonderful variety of things that you can look at here and learn about. Um, we didn't go a lot into the hormonal side of things, but there's definitely, um, that's another whole topic that we could spend time on. Um, and then uh, the testimonials. I mean, years of experience here and a, and a very um, charming video that you've put to introduce people. And I love the fact that you've got your dog in there. I'm a real animal person. So um, I encourage everybody to head over to alisazander.com. That'll be down in the description along with some social media links and other things that, that you can contact her to learn more. And um, yeah, um, I'd like closing thoughts from you. Well, I just, I had a great time talking with you too, Robin. And Mike, here's my closing thought because I had said something about seniors and you said you were a senior. And I've got to tell you, I've got the same attitude. Like I don't picture you, like in my mind, when I think of seniors, you're not the person I'm thinking of because I don't think like I'm 56 and this is not what I pictured 56 looking or feeling like. So I think age is just a number. We, we tend to limit ourselves because we think you know, a certain age means something. And I can see that that's definitely not you. But I, I think it's letting go of any limits we put on ourselves, or, you know, we might even unconsciously put those limits on ourselves when we, we think like, I can't do that. Like, oh, that might be well and good. She runs marathons, I can't run marathons. Or, you know, she does yoga, I can't do yoga. Because those like we put those limits on ourselves. So if there's something that you want to do, it's, you know, knocking through those limits and just saying, you know, what if, what if I tried? So, but I had, a, it was a joy for me to speak with you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think what's helped me, honestly, I'm, I'm now in my seventies and I think what has helped me is that I can't even remember when, uh, because it was so long ago that, I mean, I'm talking childhood. I'm not talking like 30 or 40, uh, which was also a long time ago, although it didn't seem like it. Um, I remember knowing that I was going to live until I'm 103. Don't I, I mean, people think I'm nuts when I say things like that. My children definitely do. But um, I genuinely know that's true. I mean, I have no doubt. So if I'm going to live another 30 years, um, I better darn well take care of myself and i also have i think it's helped me personally it's we're going back to that positive visualization and 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 act as if act as if it's a really important phrase that my knowing that has helped me in that i act as if i'm going to be here a lot longer well 30 years is going to go by in a snap, but but um, given the, the, the uh, amount of years that I've gone through, but nonetheless, act as if, yeah. act as if and, and believe it. And that's what is, that is what is, is that <laughs> we're going to do a tongue twisters as if is actually what is. There you go. There you go. So. Again, thank you so much, Alisa. Have I forgotten anything? I want to make sure that you've covered what you needed to cover. I think we talked about most of it. We touched on the hormones a little bit. That's one of my biggest focuses with women right now because it seems that that's become, you know, the hot topic and I can relate to it. Um, it's all, I think really the bottom line is living your best life, doing it naturally without, you know, necessarily having to settle for anything and, and just you know, you're a, a brilliant example of it because knowing that you've got, for anybody who's listening, anybody who's watching, you've got X amount of years left, right? And what do you want them to feel like? How do you want to 
um, live this precious life that you've got? And do you want to settle for having to sit on the couch because that's your only choice? Or do you want to, you know, make the decisions that allow you to feel vibrant and enjoy every single day? So that that's, that's the way I see it. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I think that's it. I think you just, you just need to believe that you can and you will. So, well, that all being said, I want to thank you so much once again for joining us today. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure. I mean, you are just, you have a plethora of information, whether it's yoga, whether it's running, whether it's general health, whether it's Ayurveda, you know, it, the list goes on. And so thank you. I think that all of us could use, and I hope that everybody in this audience was able to pick up a hint here and there. I think, boy, I picked up a bunch. So um, again, thank you. I'm going to say thank you and bye for now, Alisa. We'll look thank forward you. to the next time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.